Hi everyone, I'm Gregory Bader, your host and the producer of Graceful Aging. On today's show, we're going to give you a sneak peek at some of the wonderful shows that we have coming up this season on Graceful Aging. You know, we can't stop aging. Aging is just unstoppable. There's no pill, there's no cure, there's no diet, there's no secret formula to stop the aging process. That's for sure. But one thing that's also for sure is we can have a lot of fun as we age and we can do some smart things so that we stay healthy, we stay safe, and we have that fun that we can enjoy. And that's what we try to do on this show. And that's what we're going to do all year long. So we're gonna take a look at some topics that we haven't covered before at all and some that we have and explored them in a little bit more depth, like driving. We've talked about driving from a variety of different angles, and mostly we've talked about how to stay behind the wheel safer. We've tried to keep you on the road longer and free from accidents and free from tickets so that you can get to where you wanna go and maintain your independent life. And with that in mind, we've got a segment that we enjoyed from a prior season that we wanted to share with you again, and that is how to adjust your mirrors so that you can see more. I think it's one of the most radical things that we talked about in the shows, and I hope that you had a chance to see it, and if not, well, here it is this time. Start using your mirrors in a different way. Let's take a look. Next step is to set up our mirrors in that new BGR setting we were talking about. Okay, all right. And what does that stand for, that acronym? Blind and glare reducing. Um, it reduces your blind zones and also it helps with glare in your side mirrors at nighttime. Okay. In this case, each mirror is providing basically the same information. By adjusting your side view mirrors, vehicles that are no longer visible in your rear view mirror will become visible in your side view mirror much sooner. This, so. this is interesting to yes. show us how to do this. Well, our inside mirror actually stays the same, so that one's simple. Now, Virginia, what I'd like you to do is uh, pretend your window is closed. Perfect, and she's leaning her head against that pretend window. And you're going to adjust your mirror so that you can see just a bit of the side of the car, just uh, the very back end of the vehicle. Okay, now what I'd like you to do is come back to your normal driving position. Can you see the side of the car right now? No. Okay, and you shouldn't be able to. So, so we to don't want to see the side of the car. We do not. So to test this, what I'm going to do is pretend that I'm a vehicle approaching you from your left, mm -hmm. uh, your driver's side. What I'd like you to do so you're going to stick your hand out the window and give me a thumbs up if you can see me. And if any point you lose me, thumbs right. down. Okay. So we're going to start. You should be able to see me in the inside mirror. I'm going to leave that mirror and I should appear into the outside mirror. Right. Okay. So hand out the window. Okay. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. When do you lose me? Right there. Okay. Now, as you can see, she's able to see me just by doing a simple blind spot check. A little peripheral mm -hmm. vision, little glance to the Absolutely. left. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, did you ever lose me at any point? No. Okay. So you have seamless vision, and of course the vehicle is going to be much larger than I am. Mm -hmm. um, smaller vehicles like motorcycles, you may still lose them at some point. You can never completely in eliminate those blind zones, but this really helps greatly. Well, that's terrific. Okay. And then what about on the passenger side of the vehicle? Passenger side we're going to do now. So what I'd like you to do is flip that over. Lean over to your right so she's about center in the vehicle. So center over the mirror, or over exactly. the console. Exactly. And you're going to do the same thing, adjust it to where you can barely see the side of the car. Okay. Can you see the side of the car right now in your driving position? No. Okay. And then I'll do the same thing where I walk up along the right side of the okay. vehicle. So what I'd like you to do now just in the inside of the car. Thumbs up if you can see me. Turn your thumb down if you lose me. So she can clearly see me. We're all used to seeing our cars in those side view mirrors, but you're saying that's the old fashioned way. It is the old fashioned way, and this one is going to help a lot, especially with seniors when it's more difficult with that neck mobility to check for blind spots. I love that segment, and I hope you did too. And I hope you'll take the time, it takes about seven to 10 days to really get used to using your mirrors in that different way. But once you do, you're going to see a lot more on the road and you'll feel a whole lot safer. I know I do, I've been using it now ever since that show uh, occurred and I feel very comfortable with it, so try it out. The other aspect about driving that can be quite uncomfortable 
is when an older adult begins the dementia process, you know, that debilitating, terrible disease that there's no cure for now. It isn't just with the diagnosis of dementia, though, that we have to be concerned about taking away car keys. That isn't necessarily the time. It's much more sophisticated than, than that. And that was the point from our expert, Dr. Professor Bonnie Dobbs from the University of Alberta in Canada. Um, she was a guest when we were at the Aging in America conference. She's got some great wisdom to share with all of us. Let's take a look at a sneak peek of that show. Here we go. Troopers say 84-year-old Lois Phillips drove the wrong way for about a mile. Okay, were you feeling confused or something? I didn't think so. I think I may have been going the wrong way. I'm not sure. Motor vehicle crashes are responsible for thousands of deaths and millions of injuries each year. In addition to drivers impaired by alcohol or drugs, and those impaired by distractions, such as the use of cell phones and texting while driving, medically impaired drivers are becoming an increasing public health concern. We know that the incidence, the number of new cases of dementia and the overall prevalence of dementia is going to increase significantly in the next two to three decades. And that's due in large part to the aging of the baby boomers, my cohort. Mm -hmm. Having said that, we know that in the United States, for example, there's about 13.5% of the population 65 and older that has dementia. In Canada, it's about 11%. A significant percentage of that population is driving and we know that with a illness such as progressive dementia Alzheimer's disease it's not will driving become impaired it's when will driving become impaired one of the really important considerations in terms of driving and dementia is to not make decisions about licensing or retention of the licensing on diagnosis alone. In that if you look at the data, about two-thirds of individuals in the early stages of dementia are unsafe to drive, but a third are still safe to drive. Mm. So if we revoke licenses based on diagnosis alone, we're unfairly penalizing that third. It's not a clean-cut issue like this. Well, dementia in driving really is a sensitive, difficult topic. Uh, we spent some wonderful time with Professor Dobbs discussing it in far more detail. So when that show airs, make sure you tune in and those important in your life watch as well. Another very important topic we talked about is, surprisingly, how poorly women, yep, you women, prepare for your own future. You know, you're going to survive men in your life by five, six or more years. And at that point, you are going to be the captains of your economic ship as well. And the AARP has developed just this great program uh, called Decide, Create, and Share, I think. Yep, Decide, Create, and Share uh, that goes through a whole series of exercises and a whole series of programs to help you put your economic life in order. And we had the great chance to speak with the project director of this program, Susan Lutz, and she described in brief, the need and a little bit about the program in this short clip. Let's take a look. We're focusing today both um, uh, on older persons, but actually some people who might not qualify to even belong to the AERP. That's right. We're this actually we're focused on a younger uh, cohort, um, people that haven't received that wonderful notice in the mail. And, age 50, we're hoping some younger women will get interested in what we're doing because we're really helping women plan for their futures and that should start as early as possible. Uh, what, you you think that we're not ready for our future in this country? Well, no, I think that in some instances we plan for many things in our life. We plan for our education, we plan for our families, we plan maybe weddings, families, whatever. But sometimes we just stop when we approach 40 or more. And we have a whole future ahead of us. And it's really about trying to plan for that 
large segment of our lives. Well, women in particular do such a tremendous job. I mean, they're the captains of the family ships through life with, you know, planning everything. Um, and do they, uh, do they adopt the philosophy of captains of a ship? and Are they the last ones to take care of themselves? Well, I think we typically find that's the case. Um, they're usually the um, chief financial officer at home. Um, they're the, certainly the chief caregiver. Many are caring for children, grandchildren, parents, grandparents. And oftentimes they fall behind this long line of other people when it comes time to taking care of themselves. Well, Susan Lutz from the AARP explained in great, just in, in, with great understanding how women can put their lives in order. And, and frankly, after watching that show, it's, it's just as well geared for men, how you can put your economic and your planning life in order for uh, the older life that you hope to have. Another important thing that we talked about with two other guests, Dorian Mincer and Roberta Taylor, was about their new book called The Couple's Retirement Puzzle. Yep, it is a puzzle sometimes, trying to have both the man and the wife in a relationship work out how they want to live their, the rest of their life. So let's take a sneak peek with Roberta and Dorian as they describe the value that they have in this great little book. We're with the authors of The Couple's Retirement Puzzle, Roberta Taylor and Dory Mincer. Ladies, thanks for coming back. You. You know, how, did you, how did you come up with this title, The Couple's Retirement Puzzle? Very clever. How did, tell us the story. Well, you know, we thought hard and long about the conversations and how we wanted to name it. And we loved the idea of puzzle because puzzle is both a noun and a verb. And there are all these pieces, and you know we have these ten must-have conversations. So, you know, we love the idea of people looking and deciding what their pieces are that are important to them, and kind of putting the puzzle together, but also to puzzle it out together. You know, mm -hmm. in this very active way of thinking about it together. Were you um, an English teacher? <laughs> in a prior life. <laughs> okay. Well, that's very, I thought that was yeah. very, very clever. You have a nice description in the book of that as well. And, and as far as the structure, Roberta, of the book, why don't you give, give our viewers just a little sense of what they can expect in the book uh, as far as helpfulness. Okay. We really wanted the book to go someplace. We wanted people to have an outcome from it and not just reading another self-help book. You know, what their particular puzzle is going to look like. So with each conversation, we do have exercises at the end of each chapter that we suggest and we give the, the questions that each individual does the questions by themselves and then they share their answers mm -hmm. so that they get to hear what the other is thinking. And then they take out of that what's um, uh, sort of, they both can agree on. Mm -hmm. And that's a potential puzzle piece for them, one puzzle piece, mm -hmm. you know. For instance, one of the things that might come out of, uh, say, a health and wellness conversation is that we really do need to pay attention to, you know, have we had a stress test? if there's heart disease in the mm -hmm. family or, or something like that and to put that down as a goal in order to be on top of the things that are really important to them. That's a great way to prioritize yeah, those it really, items as it a couple. Really, yes, it really is. Mm -hmm. So then with each chapter they have these outcomes that they can then look back at at the, at the end when they're looking at their puzzle together and say is this really what's most important to us? Is there something else we've learned along the way? And again, it's a process. It's not mm -hmm. like, okay, this is what we have to do. Mm -hmm. And it changes over time. We've got a lot of puzzles in life, don't we? One of the puzzles that we face every day is actually from a past show on sleep. We had um, a wonderful guest who had a lot of initials behind her name, Irina Dahlbeck. She was a certified registered sleep specialist and she talked about sleep. It came at the end of one of our last seasons, and in case you didn't see it, here's a short clip that I think is valuable, maybe for you tonight. Irina, show us about sleep. 
Now, does it count? Can I add things together? If I take two half-hour naps during the day, there's one hour. And if I'm dozing in the Barca lounger for an hour, there's another hour. So can I get by with only six hours of sleep? Not, not really. The, the sleep should be consolidated during the night. And we, uh, I would say, advise not to take too many naps during the day because that can affect your night sleep. So if you must take a nap, should be maybe an hour, and it should be um, sort of restricted, maybe for three in the afternoon, nothing after that shouldn't be. Okay. We shouldn't be well, taking naps. Let's talk about um, this eight hours of sleep that a person should get. So it should be a, a block of time at night. Why is that so important? Well, it's just important for our overall well-being and to function properly during the day. Sleep is an uh, essential uh, physiolog physiological function of our bodies, and it's just as important as water or food. And why is it that, um, how does the nighttime enter into it? Is that part of the circadian rhythm that you talked about? That is about? a part of the circadian rhythm, yes. And, and so how is that just, a part of it? Well, that is just the way we're designed. There's several um, theories or why we sleep during the night uh, and why we're awake during the day, but mostly it's due to the circadian rhythm. One, one individual tells me, all right, I am taking, I'm dozing in, in the chair watching television at night and I feel sleepy and then as soon as I get to bed, I can't fall asleep. What, what could be some causes relating to not being able to fall asleep. Right, well, it's very important, let's say, not to exercise too close to bedtime. So we should exercise every day, but not too close to bedtime, and at least well, maybe three hours or uh, before bedtime. Uh, sort of have a, a routine, go to bed at the cer a certain time and also wake up around a certain time. Um, diet is important, so not eating heavy meals during sleep. Also keeping the bedroom comfortable and cold and dark is very beneficial. It saves um, on heating bills probably That's too. right, that too. Well hopefully tonight you won't have to count sheep. You'll follow some of those final suggestions that Irina had and improve your sleep tonight. Another item that you can improve yourself on is preventing a fall. You know, falls are debilitating. They turn your life literally upside down. And I met with two women who have a new program called Fall Stop, Move Strong. They're based in New York City. It's Celeste Carducci and Julie Cardacci. Two great names, two great women, one great program. Let's take a sneak peek at it now. From the time she was just a little girl, Celeste Carlucci knew she loved to dance. It was some place where I could go and focus and be very concentrated. She became an actress as her dance career wound down, and to make ends meet, she began teaching exercise classes. Eventually, she found herself drawn to the needs of one particular group, older adults. About the same time, Celeste met Julie Cardacci, an internationally known occupational therapist whose work took her to three different continents. Like Celeste, she too found herself drawn to the physical needs of older adults. We actually started by um, taking data. At the very first class, we, we handed out a confidence questionnaire, so people rated their confidence with different everyday activities. Um, and we did balance testing and got a pre and post measure for the balance test. Welcome to Graceful Aging. I'm your host, Gregory Bader. Today, we are in San Francisco, and we are at the Aging in America conference, and we're going to talk about falls and what you can do about them in a very fun way. And we have two fun, talented people with us today as guests. And they are Celeste Carlucci and Julie Cardacci. Do I Correct. have that right? right? Correct. So how does a New York City dancer, professional dancer, meet an Australian professor <laughs> and create such a wonderful program called Fall Stop, Move Strong? Well, there must be a story. There, there is. is a story. 
I wanted to start a program for older adults. She was in one of my classes, one yes. of the exercise classes. One she of was. the general the, classes. Yeah, the general, yeah. Uh, you know, adult mm -hmm. classes. And, um, and it's, at a certain point, you know, troubles were coming up. They were having issues, fears of falling, or, you know, how do I get down, from, get down to the mat? Or how do I get up from the mat? Or how do I reach for things? And I, in, or, you know, my knee or my hip. And there were certain things that I realized that, you know, I, and Julie and I had been friends for many years. And I'd call Julie and I'd say, mm -hmm. and I knew she was working in ger geriatrics. And mm -hmm. I'd call her up and I'd say, what do we do about this? What do you think? You know, Joe has this problem. Could you stop by in class? and take a look or you know so sometimes I'd come and maybe do a little troubleshooting or watch somebody work and give a little advice mm -hmm. but we quickly realized that there was a, a huge need right there in our community um, people wanted to exercise and you know the class was very successful but we we needed to find something to focus on this fall issue the fear mm -hmm. of falling what, as people came to the class, were they fearful of falling, or you're looking at the broader community as well? They were, they were fearful. They would discuss, you know, okay, we're doing the exercise, but they'd say, you know, sometimes when I'm outside, I'm nervous. My balance isn't quite right. And so uh, we decided to, you know, all of a sudden we brainstormed, look, we need a program. These people need a program that's both educational and a movement program. And we started the program, we put our heads together, we designed it, and uh, we pitched it to the local Jewish Community Center. And started off with four people in our class, and that mm -hmm. was eight years ago, and now we have over 125 on oh, a weekly wonderful. basis just mm -hmm. at the Jewish Community Center. Well, what great careers and what a great match between Julie and Celeste. And it's going to be even a greater combination when you come into the mix and watch that show because no one, no one, no one needs a fall, wants a fall, or can withstand a fall, especially in the older years of life. So when you see that show begin to air on your local station, make sure that your loved ones, uh, your older loved ones, your younger loved ones are right next to it and follow the advice in that program. I think the advice, the advice basically on that program and many others is stay active, walk, get up, move, walk on unlevel surfaces, keep your balance, all of those things by staying active will really help you from falling. You know, we've had other shows on graceful aging, talking about Tai Chi and talking about balance. And in future shows, we'll probably talk about yoga and all different ways for you to keep your balance and stay active. Because all of them are geared for one thing, don't fall, do not fall, stay strong, move strong. So thanks, Julie. Thanks, Celeste, for a great little peek at that upcoming show. There are so many wonderful people that we've met on Graceful Aging, and there are so many wonderful careers in the aging field. So if you're a younger person watching this, or if you're an older person with younger people in your life who are wondering about what are they gonna do with their life? What kind of career is good? Where are the jobs? I've got a secret for you. It's really no secret at all. Geriatrics, yep, you remember that a graduate movie where in that scene the person said plastics was the career. Well, I'm going to replace plastics with geriatrics. We are in the midst of an aging tsunami, and that means that older adults of all sizes, shapes, colors, cultures, and places in the world are going to need assistance and going to need smart people helping them live vibrantly. So if you're wondering about a career, take a look at the large and open geriatric field. In that vein, I had a chance to meet uh, Avani Woody, I believe was, is her name. And I met her in San Francisco at the Aging in America conference. And I asked her if she likes her career and if she would recommend a career in aging to you and to your grandchildren and to your children. And let's listen to what she said when I asked her that question about whether the geriatric field is a good field to look into. Hi, my name is Imani Woody, I'm from Washington, D.C., and I'm here at the ASA Conference in Sacramento, California. Uh, I am a aging professional. I've been doing this for a long time. I, uh, my last paid position was at AARP. Uh, my last day was December 31st um, last year. I am now working full-time on my Ph.D., which is my thesis is on elder, lesbian, and gay male African Americans who are trying to access community-based services and the barriers they may encounter in doing that. I plan to work on these issues. I've always worked on issues of disenfranchise, disenfranchisement of, um, of groups, and this group of older seniors 
uh, to be old is a awful thing in America. We're um, villainized. It's no, no one wants to be old, actually, in trying to get people to work on this thesis. Nobody wanted to be older than 57, and I'm trying to get people 67 and older. So it's very hard because no one wants to admit to being old. And in the African American community, no one really wants to admit to being gay. And so it's very hard. Those two constructs are very hard. So to answer your question, I want it to be easy. I, after getting this degree, I want to help organizations put out markers that let people know when they're older, gay, and black, that you're welcome here. We have services for you. I think um, for all people, whether you're African American or not, they, there are growing opportunities because we're talking about the baby boomers, and they call this the gray tsunami. So there are opportunities in housing with housing issues. There are opportunities in government, in policy. There are opportunities to, uh, in social work. Um, all over, if you look out at the entire landscape, there are opportunities to work in, in aging. Well, don't come in the field if you don't like older people, but remember, if you live, you'll become an older person. Uh, no, so there are challenges in changing the landscape of uh, aging, of what we in the United States consider good aging. There are other countries such as Burma where if you figure when you get old it's a status that you become wise. Your, uh, your grandchildren and everyone look up to you and society looks up to you. In our culture, you want to erase your wrinkles. You don't want anybody looking up to you that way necessarily. You want to stay part of the status quo. We're a youth-oriented society. Yeah, geron I think going to gerontology would be a great, great field. There are openings all over. Congress is giving money to uh, aging services. The Older Americans Act is picking up. Hey, Glenn, is picking up. Um, uh, programs. So yes, it's a great book to go into. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed that sneak peek and I hope you consider, or your grandchildren consider, a career in geriatrics. It's a great field. I am very excited for this season of Graceful Aging. We have all those shows and many, many more. We're going to cover a lot of other topics as well, like, yep, sex. We're also going to talk about design. We're going to dabble in dance. We're going to just cover the gamut of issues that will improve your life. So stay tuned for this season of Graceful Aging. We're having a blast on the show. We're improving life with every show, and we hope the life that we improve most is yours. Thanks for being with us, and we'll see you next time on Graceful Aging. <music>